Is that Mr. Cameron? Yes, that's right. Look, this is just to say... I shall always love India somehow. That is quite certain. But God knows why. It's BBC Two's birthday, and David Attenborough invites you to watch a selection of his favourite BBC Two programmes. Coming up in a moment, Robert Robinson asks Joanna Lumley and Frank Muir to call my bluff in a revival of the channel's much-loved panel game. <laughs> then at 20 past nine, BBC Two period drama at its finest, Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth R. is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. <laughs> There's comedy at 5 to 11 with the housewife superstar who made her television debut on BBC Two, Dame Edna Everidge. You know this friend of ours, um, Sybil Elliott? She had about four facelifts. If they winched her up any further, she'd probably have to shave. That's all I can <laughs> BBC Two wanted a panel game to lighten and brighten its schedule. But once again, it had to be one that was identifiably different from any other panel game shown on any other network. Call My Bluff required a different kind of skill from any other panel game around, knowing what obscure words meant, or at any rate, might mean. It was a huge success and ran for years. Uh, nothing, of course, can go on forever, and its long run came to an end back in 1988. But here, for our special birthday evening, we're bringing it back for one night only, with three of the old players and four newcomers. In 1965, when I was the BBC's head of comedy, David Attenborough asked me to find him a panel game suitable for BBC Two. In traditional fashion, I trawled through American game show formats and was excited to discover a complete flop called Call My Bluff, which seemed just right for us. We removed the audience participation and the cash prizes for reasons of taste and economy, and Call My Bluff ran for 23 years. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to BBC Two's game of words and wit, Call My Bluff. Word number one. Morlock. Bloat. Gocky. Amarishi. Hans. Mangaloid. Prout. Shermer. Scodgy. Decker. Waddle. Quinkle. That's what we do if we want to get a word, and lo, it oh. comes. Nestle Road is the first word. The Oxford English Dictionary's supply of obscure words is seemingly inexhaustible, as is the variety of ways in which they may be pronounced. And Ithel. It isn't Ithel, it's Istly. Sorry, chaps, it's Istel. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this. Nice besetter. Nice besetter. Nicky Becky Tur. <laughs> we were expected to believe that such words meant incredible things, and often they did. But one learned to be suspicious of any definitions which involved Turkish customs officials, Victoriana, or diseases of sheep, especially when listening to my late and much missed colleagues Patrick Campbell and Arthur Marshall. You want some statistics, I dare say. In 1757, a total of 4,720 sheep were immersed in a single day at a rabbish in Stow in the Wold. <laughs> it's done by shepherds that approach sheep with enormous shears for the purpose of cutting the wool off from underneath the sheep's tail and all around it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not wholly unconnected with the multiplication of the flock. <laughs> <laughs> if you want any more of that, I'll see you in the dressing room. <laughs> it became clear over the years that a key part of the bluffer's armory was the use of an appropriate accent. Not surprising, given the number of fine actors we have on the show. Down in Kent, Yokels mumble as follows. Be the oak tree ne'er so stout, the solerate will wear it out. <laughs> Someone who's moved to Kent. 
Clock fall, penny a rag, bang his head and Cromwell's bag. Arr, <laughs> jibbins. Nice set of scoff you scored there, Arthur. <laughs> Arthur, I can't eat that. <laughs> hoots, toots and och aye. The owdle is in. <laughs> yes, bring back Frank Muir. <laughs> Of course, I'd be the first to admit that actions sometimes speak louder than words. <coughs> Noise dancing. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Easy to play, difficult to win. When the true definitions were finally revealed, there were always surprises. As Rabbi Baddens had it, for all ye lie and bluff the new, do you ken the man whose word is true? Bluff, an upmarket version of the three card trick, and of course, it features as ever old lofty Frank Muir. Thank you, sir. In the tartan corner, I have an actress of distinction, charm, and beauty, Celia Imwe. In the blue corner, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's an old friend of mine, a thing of me, um, Peter Cook. <laughs> I told him the smoke just to annoy everyone, but there he is, and he's doing it. Who's absolutely fabulous, not to mention a class act, but of course, Joanna Lumley. Good evening. On my left hand, the almost unbelievably talented and soon to be giving us his Fagin, Jonathan Price. And on my right hand, self-confessed handsome person, <laughs> John Gordon Sinclair. <laughs> Let's see if it works. The immemorial bell tolls, and we get a word. And that word is effing. And let me remind you. I won't say, well, I won't say that word. Let, I, let me remind everyone, not least myself, what now happens. Frank Muir and his team define effing three different word, ways. Two of the definitions are, what shall I say, stumors. One of them is true. Of course, that is the one that Joanna and her team try and pick. So, Frank, I don't know if I pronounce it well, effing. No, you don't. It's <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. Oh, no, no, no. It's effinch as a Hampshire chaffinch. Ah, <laughs> and it's, in fact, mentioned in the Reverend Gilbert White's lovely, lovely book. And it's about the, the fields around Selborne alive with effigies in due season. That's what he says. It's also made into a pie <laughs> by the Hampshire, or used to be, by the Hampshire residents. And it was a kind of delicacy because they take a bit of catching, you know. Quite so, quite so. Well, they would. You'd have to run pretty fast. Uh, but, uh, right, now, Peter. Well, it's pronounced effange and oh. it is a uh, <laughs> it is a, uh, a form of glacial entrechat. It's uh, a skating term, <laughs> long uh, prior to Tall Van Dean. Uh, perhaps the most famous exponent tricks of the Effange was uh, Sonia Henny. It's what would now be called a, a, a double twirl in the centre of the ice, finishing with a huge acceleration and involving the hands twirling counterclockwise. <laughs> Could he demonstrate? The Effange. We, we have a little circular space in front of me. I, I really couldn't attempt it without the ice. No. <laughs> There's You're a just... roller skate in the house. Maybe. No. Sonia Henney. Oh, I haven't heard her name in a donkey's age. Now, Celia. Um, well, you don't often hear this word in uh, polite society, mostly because it went out in uh, 1657. Um, but at that time, a craftsman making a chair would be described as effingit. 
Um, so he might say to his uh, uh, apprentice, uh, pass me the Fanger, that's a good chap, uh, meaning he needed the particular tool for the job in hand. Um, and it really, the word means to design or shape. Well, I must say, that's a mercy. I mean, all three of the definitions are something of a mercy. It is um, a, a sort of skating manoeuvre uh, with which the name of Sonia Henny will forever be associated. It's a sort of bird that Gilbert White spoke about, made into pies as often as not, and it is to shape or design something. Now, Joanna, you have to pick one. I can't imagine, Celia, anybody making a chair saying, pass me the effinger. <laughs> I just can't imagine it. You know, it's just not a word. And you see, Peter, this, this skating movement, which was so attractive, I think it would still be there if it worked, with particularly with the counterclockwise hands, which you weren't brave enough to show us. This sounds very good, and if it, if it was still there, it would be there, effinge. They'd be there, effinging. Frank, you are telling the truth almost for the first time in your life. <laughs> well, it was certainly, uh, Frank did say it was some sort of birdie that was made into pies. Frank, were you teasing again? My thunder is awful having to lie to you. Oh, no! Oh. <laughs> Nothing whatever to do with Gilbert White and all that stuff about Hampshire. Who gave the true definition of, well, effing, I would have said, but there, uh, effage... <laughs> There you have it! <laughs> you did let you led with your chin there, Joanna. It really does mean to shape or design something. Let's have another word. Kingaling. Thirteener is the next one, and Joanna defines it for you. I'm not much of a cricketer, but this is a cricketing term. A thirteener is a whack off a cricket bat that scores that gets you thirteen runs. And in 1900, in the Westminster Gazette, an F.P. Mitchell was credited as getting a 13er. Off it went, and somehow the chaps ran to and fro for 13 runs. Now, I don't know how, because I don't know much about cricket, how a ball could disappear, I mean, for 13 whole runs, maybe under W.G. Grace's beard or something. But anyway, that's what it is, a 13er. You'd certainly have to keep it pretty hard, <laughs> wouldn't you? Uh, John Gordon. Well, uh, a 13er was... Uh, an early version of what has afterwards become known as a teenager. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so funny about that. It's, it's, of course, an Americanism. It was first recorded in the uh, 1929, the Saturday Evening Post, when a young man was um, commenting in a short story about a neighborhood party, and he said, it was lousy, just full of 13ers. That was a My American accent, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> it all seems to fit one way or another. Uh, Jonathan, what do you say? Well, I'm sure you've already guessed that this is actually a clock, and it's an Irish clock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it was first manufactured in the 19th century in the west of Ireland in a small town called Achill, which is uh, County Mayo, just off, uh, off the coast there near Westport. And it was uh, a novelty clock and it struck 13 and uh, hence the, there's a small part of Ackill which, yeah. which is called the Ackill Sound <laughs> River. So it's an Irish clock. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think it's entirely convincing. An Irish clock that strikes 13. What other Irish clock would strike anything else? 13 runs at one fell swoop and a, an early term for a teenager. Thank you. A choice. You have a choice. Well, it can't be an Irish clock. There must have been only one of them, or only one manufacturer of them, and the name, therefore, wouldn't be in the dictionary, the, the name of the clock. Um, I think... Oh, I don't know. But you would lie to me. That's the, <laughs> that's the difference in our relationship. And I am, um, therefore, driven almost against my will. I like the idea of it being an American teenager, because it's such a dreadful thought. John Gordon, true yeah. or bluff, he gave that definition. <clears throat> Oh, dear. Yeah. You can't believe it, but he made it all up. Who gave the true definition of thirteener? Here it comes. It's there somewhere. There it is. Gosh. Wow. There you are. 
13 -er was a score you got if you hit the ball and you ran 13 runs. Neither 14 nor 12, but 13. Give a ting and see what happens. Oh! Uh, squinter Pipes is the next one. Peter. Uh, squinter Pipes, uh, Pipes rather, Squinter Pipes comes from the Highlands. And um, it's really a, a very savage version of the old eights and reel. When uh, instead of just reeling around on the floor, the, the participants have to look up the vast baronial staircase at the laird who is at the top of them, or possibly on the chandelier above them. And without ever looking at the floor, they whirl around doing the squinter pipes. A Gordon Sinclair for me. <laughs> exactly. I wondered, I wondered, Frank, when he would begin to sing. I'm so pleased you didn't do much. Well, later on, there's still time. Celia. Squinter pipes is a very rude mid-century, mid-18th century word used by naughty school children of uh, people who used to suffer from a squint or a cast in their eye. They used to run out onto the street and scream, squinter pipes, squinter pipes, and the person who was afflicted would try and uh, take a hit at them or a swipe, but because of their squinter pipes would very often miss. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't do to laugh, really. <laughs> Frank, it's your turn. They were, they were up in the uh, second floor, the first floor, aren't they? It's John and Ted or something. And they've got the carpet up, and they've got the floorboards up, and they're trying to lay some hot water pipes, or cold water pipes. Take your choice. And there's, uh, there's suddenly a sudden cry of, whip, it's squid pipes. It's one of the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> the list of them come to this. Let me get through it. And they, it's one of those trade terms, like... Uh, I love, uh, have to bleed your reds. <laughs> you see. And, and the squid pipes, what happens is that normally you lay pipes by running them along the, uh, against actually, the four, uh, 90 degrees to the beams, you know, joists, and you cut wedges for the pipes. Now, now if you think of it, you've only got to lay about four pipes and you've got gone through the beams, gone through the joists right the way along. So they say, hey, hey, we'll, uh, there's a case of squid pipes here, and they just don't, they just miss the previous hole. Oh, I love the way you said you actually pronounce joists properly because good builders always say joices. Have you noticed that? Well, anyway, I'll just throw it in. No. All right, well, forget it then. As I see, you instantly have. Let me tell you, they say it's a builder's term. It's an eight some real, a very strange one. And I'm afraid it's cross-eyed. John Gordon, your choice. Well, um, I used to work at one time as an electrician on building sites, and I've never heard anyone shout at me, squint pipes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a few things, but never squint pipes. <laughs> That's one term I've never heard. Um, Celia was smiling all the way through hers, so I don't know if I believe her. Um, <laughs> and uh, as for being a, a savage version of an eight-some reel with people lying on the floor uh, called squint pipe I think that's just called being drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because that's the least plausible of them all, and I'm Scottish, I think I'll go for that one. Oh. Well, that was Peter Cook who said it. True or bluff? <clears throat> Here he comes. Peter McCook. Oh, oh nothing, oh. nothing, nothing. nothing. Didn't get a thing there. Now we need to know who gave the true definition of squinter pipes. Here he comes. No, it's not me. No. Ah. <laughs> it seems to mean, uh, you know, being cross-eyed or having a squint in your eye. I'll tingling and see what we get next. We get, well, I don't know how you pronounce it, lullibub, lulibub. I really don't have the faintest notion. John Gordon. Well, uh, the next time you're enjoying one of those um, refreshing flavoured water ices on the end of a stick, and uh, um, pull it out of your mouth and have a little think to yourself, is this a lollipop? Well, um, it is. It is. And as it um, drips uh, down your thumb and runs up your sleeve and drops onto your lap and stuff like that, you can think to yourself, um, didn't I hear once on Call My Bluff that it was actually formerly called a lullibub? Yes. So, um, you will remember this very occasion, this very occasion tonight, you will think, yes, if John Gordon said on Call My Bluff it was called a lullibub instead of a lollipop, or as well as a lollipop, then that is the true definition. Yes, well, what do you say, Jonathan? Uh, in the uh, 18th century, um, when a newly ennobled Cockney was going around his, uh, his new palace or his new mansion, 
with uh, Capability Brown planning the gardens, he would say to, uh, say to his designer, he said, uh, here, Brownie, what we need here, right by that uh, pond down there, is a few of them gnomes with the fishing rods. <laughs> they go into the pool, they look marvelous. And uh, Capability Brown would say, ah, oh, yes, yes, of course. Yes, a few lullabobs, marvelous. And so Brown would go away and embarrassed by writing down on his plans, garden gnomes or such like, he would instead write in code, lullabobs. <coughs> so no one would actually know that Capability Brown would put garden gnomes in his gardens. <laughs> <laughs> do anything for money. Joanna. Long ago, in about the sort of 1300s, there was a group of monks who made pretensions to living a life of piety and humility, but in actual fact, they were living the life of Riley. They used to dine off roast peacock, they used to quaff Rhenish wine from silver gilt goblets, they used to glug things down out of great crystal dishes and always keeping this pious thing for the outside world, so people thought they were having a bad time. They were called lullabobs, for underneath their gloomy shell, they did themselves extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. There we all have it. It's a lollipop. It's a garden ornament. Uh, and it's a, well, a good time monk, if there is such a thing. <laughs> Peter's choice, he has to choose one. Well, I'm not particularly persuaded of this um, alternative to the lollipop. As John Jordan was saying, I think it is very unlikely that the ennobled cockneys in the 18th century, name one ennobled cockney in the 18th century, <laughs> let alone with capability round popping around, not having the initi initiative to change the name garden gnome to garden novel or whatever he wanted to. <laughs> uh, my suspicion is it was these uh, good time monks of Joanna's. Well, she certainly said that. True or bluff, Joanna? Tell us now. I'll tell you now. Ah! <laughs> Not a thing. Let's see who gave the true definition of lullibub, lullibub, or pronounce it as you will. Yes! Oh! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten what it was. Could you remind us? <laughs> it was a lollipop. A lollipop. Oh. Yes. Yeah. That's and Peter, silly, I saw Peter, <clears throat> whose almost invisible sword that he directed against himself and threw himself on it <clears throat> as he was jeering at the true definition. But that's what it is. A lullibub or lulibub is a lollipop. <clears throat> Let's have another word. And um, it's quirken. I don't know whether I, again, I don't know whether I pronounce it properly. Celia. Uh, no, not quite. It's quirken, um, and it's a dialect word from Northumberland, and it describes a molehill. Um, and there's a, a region in Northumberland called, that used to be called Hexhamshire where you can still find quarkiners who will get rid of your quarkins for you by uh, <laughs> slipping a stoat down the molehill. <laughs> Pretty handy with stoats in, uh, in Northumberland. Right, now, Frank. You're in Northamptonshire and you've ridden hard to hounds, but it's the Hunt Supper. And you woof down an enormous great chunk of Melton Mowbray pie, and it sticks in your gullet. Willing hands rush up, and particularly people who don't like you, and thump you on the back. <laughs> and you go, quack, quack. <laughs> May I? You go, quack, quack, quack. Because quacking is an old term. Hunting folk up, up that area for uh, choking. Choking with laughter may happen a little later in the show. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. You've done very well in that regard yourself, sir. Uh, however, enough of this. Peter's turn. Oh, yes. Quirkin. 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 Where? Where? Where are they? Behind me? In front of me? Underneath me? Where could they be? Oh, 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 God. It's to be very nervous on, and on the lookout for something that's about to attack you. It's to be on the key vive, the fear of being ho, oh, oh, something. <laughs> you, you quirken with almost terror. Quirken, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it used to be Frank who got the Sir Henry Irving prize. <laughs> But uh, I think he's had it snatched away just now. But anyway, let me tell you, it's to choke, it's a molehill, and it's to become kind of alert on, uh, you know, uh, on the key beam. Jonathan. Um, 
It doesn't really strike me as a verb, does it? it you know, to quirk them. You'd quirk. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to go straight for... Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to plump. You're not going to plump. I now, think I might plump. Me. You're going to plump. Only I'm, if you quirk. I do both. I'll quirk, you plump. plump. A molehill. A molehill. Celia, draw a bluff. Oh, whoops. She's so excited. <laughs> there, nothing. <laughs> Let us swiftly know the truth of the matter. What is the true definition of quirk and quark and... Quark, 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 quark. Oh, oh quark. <laughs> quark. Oh, wow. It's to choke. Let's have another word. To choke. And now what do we have? We have dimps and uh, Jonathan, dimps. Dimps. Um, when West Somerset uh, folk are talking amongst themselves, they use a dialect which sometimes appears like a completely different language. They think, say things like, uh, where be to? <laughs> when they're asking where someone is. They don't say thing, they say thick. And uh, if they wanted to say old, they would say, uh, Mold? <laughs> or, um, <laughs> and likewise, if they wanted to say it was getting dark, or it was twilight or dusk, they would say, dead. <laughs> so if they were saying something like, uh, um, I can't see this, my old friend, it's getting dark, they would say, um, uh, where be to? I can't say that. <laughs> well, friend. Yeah, we did. <laughs> That's going to get you an awful lot of friends in Somerset, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's ask Joanna. Well, in central Somerset, and I'm talking now about the flat and sedgy area around Glastonbury Tor, there's still enough little bits in the land that water can collect into little sort of dew ponds around there, and the, the peat cutters of this sedgy land call them dimps. And cattle in the days pre-pasteurization, cattle who drank from unfenced dimps, the milk they gave used to taste of iron, because of course all the land there has got iron from the tin mines and things in those areas. So that's sort of dimp, so probably from a dimple. Yeah, that's a good thought, isn't it? Or dumps. Yes, or, or, or yes, quite. Uh, John Gordon, your turn. Well, I'm in uh, North Somerset. I'm doing a little, <laughs> tour. <laughs> doing a little tour of Somerset here. And uh, around such delightful villages as uh, Monk Silver and Stogumber, a dimps is someone who's known as a bit of a dafty or a simpleton or a, a fathead, a silly ass. Sit down, you daft donkey. That kind of a person. And uh, when, uh, when Samuel T. Coleridge, Coleridge was writing uh, Kubla Khan, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alpha Sit, someone barged in, interrupted him, interrupted the flow of the poem, and uh, he couldn't really quite get the same feeling back into it, then that person in that in uh, North Somerset would have been known as a dimps. It means a silly ass. It means the dusk. It means a pool of water. All somewhere in Somerset. Celia's choice. Oh, gosh. Well, I've just come back from Somerset, and I didn't hear anybody talking like John <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Uh, I'm listening out. Carol's with wet feet, though. Well, yeah. <coughs> uh, but I was quite attracted to Joanna's dimple idea and the... Uh, the milk tasting of iron. I thought that was very um, aesthetic. But um, there's something about uh, Jonathan's knowledge of fatheads that makes me think <laughs> he might be right. You're choosing John I'm choosing Gordon. John Gordon. Yes. yes. And you said fathead. it was a fathead. True or bluff? Here it comes. He's got it there. Oh, oh yes, he has. Thing. We need to know now, quickly before we end, who gave the true definition of dimps. Here it comes. Oh. There you have it. <laughs> it simply means the dusk or the twilight or the gloaming or thereabouts in, in South Somerset, I think you said. And, oh, look at the score. Gosh, oh. I say. Oh, yeah. Let me wipe my glasses. Three all. Three all. In that case, nobody has won. Everybody has won. Hooray! <laughs>
Wonderful, wonderful. That ends our little tour of the haunted wing of the Oxford English Dictionary. Good night now from Frank Muir. Good night, Will. Joanna Lumley. Good night. Peter Cook. Celia Imrie. Good night. John Gordon Sinclair. And Jonathan Price. Goodbye. <laughs> You're watching BBC Two on its 30th birthday. David Attenborough's choice of his favourite BBC Two programmes continues in a moment with the very best of period drama, Elizabeth R. Free, free, free! <laughs> then at 5 to 11, a rare glimpse of a period queen of comedy who first appeared on BBC Two, housewife superstar, Dame Edna Everidge. Let's meet on an official barge. I was given... Look at the little girl shaving. Look at her. <laughs> oh, look. That's Gladys. That's Gladys. Freedom is coming tomorrow. Maybe you know some kids with bad attitudes. Cursing the soldiers, shouting Viva Mandela. Oh, come on. Maybe there's some teachers with bad attitudes. Teachers who teach children to hate and burn. The fight for change. I hate the violence. But I cannot stand aside and let others die for me. The story of hope. What do you want? Freedom. Freedom is just the beginning. And the tragic loss of childhood innocence. Screen 2 presents the highly acclaimed Sarafina. Tomorrow at 5 past 10 on BBC Two. Hey!